so stay hopefully um and hopefully we'll be done at like 7 30 um because this lab again i will stay and those of you who want to stay and work on the lab um and i will have all those office hours like i did last week um so that was do you guys remember thursday those were those extra office hours um so that's tonight i'll stay until nine and then thursday at noon that link is still there it will disappear um, my other class i think i put this in the email um, it this is actually the link for my other classes office hours so i tried to keep the office hours separate uh, they had nothing due last thursday but if any any of them come um they, I, I will probably give them more priority than you, but even just being there. Uh, Thursday evening, that's open for all my classes. Um, so from five to seven. So if there's a lot of people there, I might put you in rooms based on the class. Uh, what did we do Friday, four to six? And then Saturday morning um, from 10 till noon. And I just wanted to remind you on Saturday morning, I'm in another class. And so if you get there and I'm not letting you in, just be patient. Um, cause yeah, it's like my fairy godmother's in that class, I think. All right, so I'm actually going to go through, and I was thinking of doing that just because I have space on this page. Um, if you watch the pre-lecture video and you print stuff, you probably have already written stuff, um, but you can add to it. But these steps, I, I walked through them really briefly in the video, and it's something I want to emphasize I said in the video. The lab, like with the naming, the lab had all the stuff was typed out as words, but it's pretty dense right now to read those three pages or four pages. Um, as you do practice with this and then go back and read it, it will start making more and more sense. So kind of like with the naming, it's going to take practice. And then when you go back and do more of the naming, it started to make more sense and started to flow. And then even that, I would encourage you all to go back and watch the naming videos and you'll be like, oh, I don't know why I thought it was so confusing. Um, but the steps that you're going to follow, and this is really brief, and again, they're written out in more words. Um, the first step is we count the valence electrons. And this is where I really hesitate in the video every time I made it because I'm in a conundrum because uh, you guys don't have the periodic table that I like. Um, but the third page of your notes, you can skip to the third page of your notes. It does have it. So Linus Pauling was on my side. Linus Pauling came up with the electronegativity table, which is all about NOF. But these numbers at the top of his table, he numbered the families used to be numbered as A group numbers, and then the middle was B group numbers. Um, and those A group numbers are the valence electrons. What they do now is they just number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 through 18. So this is 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 is noble gases. Um, so my, what I would encourage you to do is to actually, the periodic table that you're using is to above your groups to write the A numbers. So above the 18, write 8A, 7A, 6A, 4, 5A, 4A, and 3A, because that will make it much easier to follow. Sorry, I'm looking for a periodic table. Um, so again, the one that I always gave out in class, it had both numberings. And we actually never looked at the higher number ones. We always used the A numbers. So for NF3, which is our example on the first page. And again, I did this one in the video, um, but nitrogen would have five valence and each of the fluorine would have seven valence. So counting the valence electrons is the key. Um, and so when we do this on the next page, we're gonna go through it. Um, so this ha ends up with 26 electrons, that number, You'll see on the lab, the first column is the valence electrons. And a lot of students, that's the first thing they do. Um, you should get an even number because electrons like to be in pairs. But again, the nitrogen is five, and then there's three times the seven for each of the fluorines, and that's 26. All right, the second step is you find the center. And the center is the least electronegative. So electronegative, 
just abbreviate, is electron greed. That's my definition of it. You can go online and get a really elaborate definition. That is Noth. That is the whole thing of Noth. That's like our central theme. That's why I wore my Noth tonight. And many of you did. I'm still having Noth envy of Christie's um, creative ability. So Linus Pauling on the third page. Um, he came up, he won a Nobel Prize. As I talked about in the video, he won two Nobel Prizes uh, and they took his passport away. But uh, his, he made up this table. He made it up. It's fictitious. But it helped him to be able to explain why carbons and hydrogens are nonpolar, why carbon and hydrogens don't mix with water, why when you have an oil spill, which is carbon and hydrogens, it just sits there as a glump on the water. Um, yeah. So he made up numbers to be able to explain everything he was doing. 50, 70 years ago, and it worked. There is a new table out, um, but I'm kind of, Linus Pauling is one of my heroes, and so he, we're looking at his table. You don't need to know the table. You just need to know fluorine on everybody's table is the greediest. And if you look, NO and F, they get the biggest numbers. Um, yeah, chlorine's up there too, but doesn't flow as nice as the NOF. So, N, O, and F uh, are going to be our greediest with fluorine is the greediest. So all you really need to know about electronegativity is fluorine is the greediest. On your study set for Monday, those are some of the questions you'll see. So the center is the least greedy. So in this case, it would be nitrogen. Step three, we do a single line which is a covalent bond. And covalent, hopefully you remember when we did naming, means that we're sharing two electrons. So you do a single line from the center to each of the ones on the outside. And again, in the lab, it will have it written like that. So you don't want to draw nitrogen, fluorine, fluorine, fluorine. They don't become strung out like that. They don't like that. They like to be in little balls. So they want to center and everything else is around it. Um, and then step four is the octet rule. Uh, we talked about the octet rule when we did ions. And the octet rule is that they want eight valence electrons. The octet rule has been changed to that they all want to be like a noble gas. And they renumbered the periodic table, but Linus Pauling's periodic table, the noble gases were the eight A's because they have eight valence electrons. Um, so it's the S's and P's that are important here. Since we're working with covalent bonds, we're working with the non-metals, so we don't have to worry about the D's. So that's why we can go with this older, um, more useful way of numbering. So uh, the octet rule, and we look at the outer atoms because they're the greedy ones. And we put them as pairs. So we show dots. Uh, one of the things I emphasized, so this is what you're going to be doing in the lab. This is like half of the lab. So I think you have like 20 of these that you draw. And then we're going to describe them. And that's what I'm going to be doing in the lecture tonight, um, is showing you how to describe them. The purpose of drawing them is so we can describe them. Uh, and so everybody approaches the lab a little bit different. Some people do all their drawings first, and then they go back and do the descriptions. And some people do everything for each one. They draw and describe, draw and describe. It's, it's your lab. But if you do a north, south, east, west, as you're drawing it, that will show you your eight. So we have two, four, six, eight. So it makes it easy to see. All right, the fifth step, step five, is the octet for the center. And this is the rule that's a little bit more complicated. And again, in the lab, so when you do the lab, realize the first page of the lab walks you through these steps with more words. So um, when we would do this in person, there would be several people I would scold. And I'm like, you got to go back and read that page. You haven't 
spent any time. Um, so like back to Shaylee's question that when we get done tonight, you might be like, all right, I want to go back and rewatch your video. So I feel comfortable with drawing these. And so that's what the video is. I just do the three on this page. Um, but the center, uh, and it goes back that the extra electrons go on the center. And it goes back to that number that we got, which was the 26. Um, so right now, each of the fluorines has eight. So that's 24. So 25, 26. So counting electrons is kind of an art. Um, everybody thinks about them different, and that's going to be kind of an individual thing. The nitrogen does have an octet. This line counts as sharing electrons. So sharing electrons means that it counts as two for each side it's attached to. So for the fluorine, it has eight. The nitrogen has two, four, six that it's sharing, and then two of its own. It doesn't matter what it started with. The whole point of this is that they all end up at an octet. Um, there is another step with step five, and that's when we get to double bonds. And we'll worry about that on the next page, or you can go back and watch the video. But what I want to do is go through all these other possibilities, and we're going to do that with the next page. And then we're going to talk about polarity, which is that last page with Linus Pauling. Oh, actually, we're going to get to the double bond rule here with the first one. So I'm going to pause for a moment. Um, and so you can either count your valence electrons for each one. You can try doing a sketch for the first one. Actually, let's do the first one together, and then I'm going to pause. Um, and you can try the other ones, and then I'll add that stuff in there. So for the SiO2, silicon has four. And each oxygen has six, so that would be six times two. So again, we're going with the A group numbers. The oxygen is a 6A. Linus Pauling didn't use Roman numerals, so it made it easier. Um, and the silicon is under the 4A. I do not need to see this math. You're not going to see me do it actually anymore unless you get it wrong, and then I will go through it with you. So the valence electrons is key. A quick note. This one here does have a negative one charge. What does the negative one mean? It gains an electron. Hello. I'm videotaping. I don't know what they're saying to me. OK. Um, yes. So who said that? It's gaining an electron. Shaylee. Yay. Oh, it's exciting. A new person. I'll write your name on the board when, when we do our break. Um, so what it means is this one gained an electron. So the only thing that affects of the picture and everything we're doing is when you count your electrons. So we would do the nitrogen is five and the oxygen, and then we would add another one. So the negative one means you add one more. All right, and I'll let you guys do that on your own. Let's go ahead and walk through this one. We put the silicon on the outside. I'm sorry, silicon in the middle, the oxygen's on the outside because the oxygens, the greedy ones are on the outside. The greedy ones want to have all of their own. Um, and so NOF or F, O, and N, NOF backwards. So maybe gnomes are dyslexic. That's why they say NOF. Um, and then you put your dots on the outside. And in all honesty, those first four steps are really not bad. A lot of students will do this. They're like, do this for all of them. Um, and actually, when I give you the break in a moment, at least get that far in each one of these. And then that step five for the center is the one that um, takes practice. And that's what the lab is about. And that's what this page is about. So we can't put any dots on the center. And hopefully you guys are not using pen like your teacher is. Um, I, I commented in my email that I sent out, you should all answer. I'm determined that this class is going to be the class everybody answers. You have to, there's two parts to the email. Anyway, um, it tells you to go buy an eraser. If you did not for the naming lab, you want it for this lab. 
um, there's no more electrons because we have eight on this oxygen and eight on this oxygen, and that gives us 16. We can't just start adding dots to the silicon because we've run out. So we're going to have to move some. Now, you can't just cross these off and put them on the silicon because now the oxygen doesn't have enough, and the oxygen was the greedy one. It definitely doesn't want to do that. So it moves and shares. That's with the very last step. It's like 5B. If, if you can't get to an octet, this is a step of last resort. Um, I will tell you this, these first three have double bonds. And that's a problem. Uh, it happens also on the lab. The first three have double bonds. And so students decide everything needs double bonds. Double bonds are a last resort. You only go to a double bond if there's no other way. They don't want to share. Sharing's really the last thing atoms want to do. Um, but so these two moved in here. So the oxygen still has an octet. It has four of its, its sharing, and then it has four of its own. The silicon, though, only has two, four, six. So we're going to have to do it again. So we'll cross two off. Ideally, you have an eraser. Uh, and we'll put it in the bond. And so again, this oxygen has two, four, six, eight. So four sharing and four of its own. The silicon sharing all eight of its electrons. But we're there. We're good. So I'm going to pause. I can give you guys five minutes. You can either count. You can take a break. Let's see if I pause correctly. I did it right. All right. So SO3 should be 24. So you have six and 18. So we put the sulfur in the center. Oxygens are on the outside, unless they're with fluorine, because fluorine's greedier, or they're with what? Oh, somebody else. Somebody new. Hydrogen. Get a bonus point. Hydrogen. Who said that? Olga. I was going to say that sounded like Olga. <laughs> it's like my goal for the night. All right. That was because the, the others of you were all sending loving thoughts to Olga. Um, and we put dots around all the oxygens. The oxygens get their octet. And then we put all the extras on the center. So it gets the octet, but there's no extras. So we have 8 plus 8 plus 8. It's 24. We've used them up. So there is a trick to the double bonds. If you look, the sulfur right now has two, four, six. So it only needs one more bond. So we only need one double bond. So this is the point of my, my story that I put in your lab. It doesn't matter where you put the double bond. Um, on, on this one and the other example I did in the video, we ended up with double bond on each side. This one, we only want one double bond because that gives me my sulfur as two, four, six, eight. Wherever you put the double bond, you cross out the electrons. This is really special. This is something called a resonance. This is part of Linus Pauling's Nobel Prize. He did a lot for that Nobel Prize. But that double bond is not actually there. It's actually here, here, and here. It's shared by all of them. These two electrons are everywhere. Remember, electrons are really waves, so it's a wave pattern over the whole thing. Um, but we represent it like this. And again, when you cross out your two electrons, it doesn't matter which two you cross out, but you have to cross out a pair because electrons, that up down arrow thing. All right, so if you put your double bond here, that's fine. If you did it on the right side, if you did it below, I recommend, again, doing a north-south-east-west grid, and then when we get into geometry, I'll tell you how to modify. All right, this should be 18. So the nitrogen was 5, uh, 6 times 2, so 12 for the oxygens, and then negative 1 means we add an electron, so we have 18. So again, nitrogen, I tend to draw them one on each side, um, but you can draw below and next to, it doesn't matter. Give your octets to the outside. That's your dots. Again, I recommend if you're using, if you like color and you want to use pens, find those erasable pens. 
Now, before you go double bond crazy, that's the last step. There is a step before it. Any extras go on the center. They want their own electrons. We have eight plus eight. We have 16. So there's still two. We put the extra two on the center. This is a tough one. Again, it's on the video. You can go back and look at it. When you do the lab, you're going to get practice at this. So you have to put those two on the center. Now we have 8 plus 8 plus 2, which is 18. And students will move on. And you don't want to move on. Why? What's wrong with my picture? Everybody's sending love. Somebody. Somebody new, be brave. All right. <laughs> the nitrogen doesn't have an octet. That's what you're all thinking. Um, it, it has two, four, six. So we need one double bond to get to eight. So Ever side you cross your two electrons off, that's the side that you put the double bond to. Again, this is a resonance. The double bond is actually going back and forth. That's why it's called a resonance. Um, I don't know if I'm spelling right. Because uh, the double bond could have been on the left or the right. It doesn't matter. We represent it as a single and a double. It's really a one and a half bond. All right, the next one is 32, as Shaylee had correctly said. Um, I, I did want to point something out on this. This is chlorine. So this is carbon, two chlorines, and two fluorines. It's not carbon, carbon, I2, F2. Uh, that is Cl2. So that is, for some reason, chlorines are really hard on some students. Uh, the carbon is in the center. Carbon loves the center. If carbon is present, it is always in the center. Carbon loves the center. Silicon also. They're in the four A's, and that is actually something special. The four means they're going to make four bonds. Nitrogen likes to make three. Oxygen likes to make two. Notice I'm saying like instead of always. Carbon and silicon make four bonds. The other ones have a tendency, like these guys need five, or they have five, they need three to get to their eight. But uh, And then chlorine, chlorine, fluorine, fluorine. Now, it doesn't matter if you put the chlorines across from each other or next to each other. We're doing a two-dimensional representation. I was looking to see if I made this one of a three-dimensional um, molecule. So you just put everything around the carbon. There is a center and everything else is around the center. And then you put dots on the outside. Give them all their octet. So, you know, Tatum, you frowned when I said you can only get one bonus point a day. because I know you like getting three or four. But in that video I made, there is a bonus point hidden in it. And only Katie answered me. And so I'm, I'm humbled that I'm thrilled that Katie watched my video. And actually, in the previous video, there was only one person who responded to the bonus point that was hidden in the pre-lecture video. Um, all right, we have eight, 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 everything. Again, the north, south, east, west makes it beautiful for drawing these. And if they each have eight times four, that is 32. I count by eights because I can. I was like, um, you can do two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That you're counting a lot more, but if they're all in eights. All right, NF3 should be 26. We did this one. So we did this one on the front page. So we'll just draw it again. I don't know why I picked the same one. So you give all your fluorines, everything, single bonds. Don't make a double bond unless you have to. In fact, halogens never, ever double bond. That is a true never, ever. I think it shows up in the study set. Halogens are right there. 
They're right next door to being a noble gas. They make a bond. That's all they need. They have no reason to make a double bond. So, all right, H2O, eight. Hydrogen is just one, oxygen is six. Oxygen is in the center because hydrogen cannot be. Um, hydrogens are always on the outside. And then you put your dots. So you can show the hydrogen. Sorry, I'm in the habit of drawing my water that way. Um, you can put your dots above and below. You can make them into Mickey Mouse ears, like, or ladybug ears that are apparently not a real thing. Nofs are and gnomes are, but ladybugs with ears love cats, though. So you can draw it either way. It doesn't matter. It's a two-dimensional representation. Now we're going to make a segue. So that's drawing them. And again, if you decide, okay, I'm going to stay tonight. And I'm just going to draw and get that done. Um, we're going to go into what's called the Vesper geometry. And I talk about this briefly at the end of the video. Uh, we're going to do something called electron clouds. So I'm going to circle my clouds. You do not have to, but you can on these notes because it might help you. Uh, these are clouds. So these are electron clouds around the center. So this one has two. And so we call that linear and the bond angle is 180. So I'm going to go through this kind of fast, but that way you have the, the lab has this too. Um, but what it is, is those clouds are electron clouds, right? Remember the nucleus is tucked deep, deep in there and 99.9999999999% is empty space where the electrons are, where the negative is. And these, these two clouds are balloons they're stuck to the silicon because these are covalent bonds. They can't be broken unless you have a chemical reaction. And so they're going to get as far apart as they can, which is 180 degrees. So the bond angle is a description of how far apart they are. The Vesper is a word that describes the angle. Um, all right. So on the next ones, we have three clouds on both of these. These both have three clouds. So on the SO3, we have, I'm going to do it in the next, we have three atoms and zero lone pairs. Uh, and in this one, we have two and one, meaning we have two atoms attached to the center and one lone pair. Uh, in the lab, it has this chart, like without all the pictures, um, and I split them like this. So these are three atoms and zero uh, electron pairs. And so when you have three, this is the one that you can redraw it. Some students, once they see their picture, they'll redraw it. Um, so you can just make a little sketch and those oxygens are going to push each other apart, but they're all attached to the center. So it makes a kind of peace sign. And so they're all an equal distance apart. The whole way around is 360, so we're splitting it into three pieces. That gives us 120 degrees. And we call this planar triangle. So the Vesper is always the total number of clouds. So this is also planar triangle. And again, you guys have this recorded forever and ever, but it's also in the lab, the words are there. And once you work on the lab, sometimes going back and reading um, that dense word stuff, it will help. We're gonna come back and do the molecular in a moment, but the Vesper determines the bond angle. So the Vesper and the bond angle always go together. So you can have two, you can have three, or these guys all have four. So four atoms, zero lone pairs, three atoms, one lone pair, 
three plus one is four, or two lone pairs and two atoms. So, it's usually the trick question I ask is, what, what's the angle going to be? And everybody's like, oh, 90. They're all 90. Um, so here we go. Somebody else can get a bonus point. Somebody new. If you watch my video, you know the answer, maybe. Maybe not. Nobody watched the video. Nobody wants a bonus point. I don't even know how many people are still here. This is actually, these are all 109 degrees. These, um, these first three at the top, the linear and planar triangle ones, they are actually flat. They are two-dimensional. So planar means two-dimensional. Uh, and I talk about that in the video. I actually have the molecules here. I forgot about that. I made them all for you. All right. Um, but these expand out into, it's hard to see because I'm really little, into um, these tetrahedrals. And if you're somebody who's like desperate and you're like, I need those kits that you have, we can talk. <laughs> but everybody ends up figuring out from the paper. And so um, this is, you can Google what does a tetrahedral look like or a tetrahedron. Um, I always learned as tetrahedral. Uh, it is actually considered a sacred geometry going back to all different cultures. Uh, and it is in the center. It is carbon's favorite shape, but it's not the only shape uh, or geometry. I also wanted to mention that, that um, sometimes I use the word shape um, and I'm meaning geometry. And sometimes I use geometry and I mean shape. So I just kind of interchange those words. But the tetrahedral is the total number of clouds, and it's 109-ish. These bond angles are ishes. If you want to be more precise, we can. It's 104.5, 107, 109.5. Or are you all happy with 109-ish? Usually everybody's happy with 109-ish. But um, And same with this. It's not actually 120, but it's close enough. So. All right, so when you do the lab, be like, okay, I can draw them now, and then count your total clouds. Some student, it helps them to, to draw the pictures. We're gonna make a chart here. This chart is also in the lab condensed. You can also condense it on the previous page. Usually I do that in the class um, where it's just the words, but in all honesty, this is in the lab already typed out for you, and so then you can make your own little chart. So we're going to fill in the middle column for molecular geometry. And what I will tell you is the molecular geometry is the same as the Vesper geometry. Sorry, I'm looking for my little models. If there are zero electron pairs, these two are the same. So it's linear, linear. We're repeating ourselves. So this is where I learn a lot about what goes on in our mind. I'm okay with you writing linear over both boxes if you realize it's going to be linear once. Um, some of your minds are like, no, I need to answer each question she asked. She asked for Vesper geometry and she asked for molecular geometry. And so you can write linear, linear. Same with the next one. It is planar triangle, planar triangle. There are no lone pairs. Um, planar triangle looks like this. In the video, I'm a little bit bigger than this itty bitty box, but it's a two dimensional triangle. Um, and so the shape, the, the molecular geometry comes out the same as the Vesper. Again, the Vesper is looking at the bond angle. What happens on this one when you have a lone pair, this is when we get a new answer here. And so that's what my little dot at the top is representing. Um, that that lone pair takes up space, just as it actually takes up a wee bit more space than the oxygen atoms, because the oxygen atoms have nuclei in them. Um, but it does, so what it does is it actually pushes the oxygens down. And so if you drew this, the oxygens are being pushed down by the nitrogen. 
as opposed to linear where nothing's pushing the oxygens here for the silicon, they're straight across from each other. Here, these, these lone electrons are pushing down the oxygens. And so they truly are 120 degrees apart. So what I found is there is a number of students who it actually, they'll make their sketch and then next to it in the Vesper box, they'll make a second sketch. Besides writing the word, they also like to make a sketch where they show better the angle because it helps them to see it. Um, this is, we're going to call it bent. There's three different names. So some books call it V-shaped because it looks like a V if you turn it upside down. There's no upside down and right side up. Um, some books call it angular because it has an angle now. It's not straight across. It has a bend. We're going to go with bent because it's four letters. It's the easiest to say. It's bent. All right. So the next ones. Which one is going to be tetrahedral for the molecular geometry? And why? Maybe I only have you, you like eight left in here. I can't see like the whole class. So the first one's tetrahedral, tetrahedral. It's funny because I can see Kaylee and um, Tatum and they're like wanting to answer me. Um, no, it says there's 18 of you here. <laughs> Brittany's probably going crazy like typing stuff in. Brittany definitely just said it's tetrahedral. I am. I know, but you already have a point, Brittany. I, it's, she, she's probably writing in big letters. It's tetrahedral. Um, so you can say tetrahedral once and just write it big across both boxes, or you can say tetrahedral, tetrahedral. All right, so the next ones will have a different word. They'll have tetrahedral something. So again, if you have lone pairs, there's a second answer. And again, this chart is in your book, in your, in the lab. Um, but this is, gives us pictures to go with it. And I will tell you this, the first page of your lab is this chart again. It's just different pictures that you're going to draw, but it's going to come out exactly this order. And then I mix them up. Um, but it's to give you practice so that you can see it. Um, so when you have this one lone pair, that one lone pair is pushing these fluorines down. So these fluorines are being pushed down and they're making it into a pyramid so that's my lone pair at the top and it's kind of hard to see but this is not flat it's sticking up above my hand whereas the other one is flat and so we call it a pyramid it is technically called a triangle based pyramid so sometimes we'll put a triangle um, the great pyramids in Egypt are square-based pyramids, so they have a square at the bottom. These have a triangle because they were a tetrahedral. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think, I can't remember if the temples in Mexico are triangle-based or square-based. There's pyramids all over our planet because there was one time, they're all over this country too. There are obelisks in this country, so our national monument in Washington, D.C., that's, um, but that's a square-based one. Anyway, this one's a pyramid, and it reminds me of something I want to emphasize up here, the pet peeve of your teacher. You cannot just say planar, you'll lose credit. You have to say planar triangle. The triangle symbol has to be there. You cannot just say triangle, because this is a triangle, too. It's just a triangle that has lift to it. So up here you do need to say planar triangle. I'm okay with you showing the symbol for a triangle, but you have to have the word planar with it. Um, it's also called trigonal planar, if, if you like that term better. All right, and then we get to this. These electrons, because of the tetrahedral shape, did I really not make water? I did. Um, the lone pairs, are up here, they're kind of like the Mickey Mouse ears or ladybug ears, and they push the hydrogens down. And that is why water comes out as this beautiful bend. So we have another bent, but this is a tetrahedral bent. How is the tetrahedral bent of water 
different from the planar triangle bent up here. Somebody? So is that it, are there more atoms? There are. Oh, so almost. You almost have it, Kristen. Look at the numbers. There's, there's more uh, lone pairs. On this one, there's two lone pairs, which means what is different? Look at the bond angle. The, the bond it? angle, I guess. The bond angle, yeah, this bent is actually not as bendy. It's 120 because of what you said. This has only one lone pair, so it pushes it down. But what you were saying, this has more lone pairs. This actually gives us those ladybug ears and it pushes it down more so we get a greater angle um, or greater bend, I guess, the angle. So here we go. We're to half the, half the participants. All right. We have one more column. Didn't quite make my goal of 7.30, but we're gonna go to the next page and then we're gonna come back and fill out the polar nonpolar. All right, Linus Pauling was born in Portland, Oregon, down on Hawthorne, 34th and Hawthorne. Anybody know what he won Nobel Prize for? You should all Google this. Uh, he won it for bonding, uh, the Alpha Helix, and then he won one, won the Peace Prize. I talked about that. Uh, most people know him as the vitamin C guy. He actually got kicked out of the National Academy of Science. They wouldn't take his papers anymore because they thought he was crazy because he told everyone they should be taking vitamin C. Um, so I actually, um, the woman who was the secretary when I first started here, so this is, this is before Joey, so this is 24 years ago, I believe. I think I may have been pregnant with Joey. Um, anyway, I was in college for acupuncture and I was here teaching and she had breast cancer. And so she was asking me questions about vitamin supplements and stuff since I was in the acupuncture college and she just wanted to see what my opinion was. And, and so she was asking me what I thought about doing this and that. Um, and again, this is 25 years ago when like now everyone talks about supplements and stuff. And, and she looked at me and she said, well, Linus told me I should be doing this and this. And I looked at her and I said, Linus? Linus who? She goes, Linus Pauling. And she keeps talking, but she just like talked about a matter of factly. And I'm just sitting there like my mouth just drops. Um, Cause this man was like, as humble as could be, he actually, so double Nobel laureate, only one other person has ever won two Nobel prizes. Uh, and he wasn't being invited to give speeches anymore because he really believed in natural nutritional medicine and stuff. Um, and so he would just go around to the public and give talks. And so all the secretaries, the receptionists at school knew him and had met him. Um, he'd stopped doing these talks when I had moved to Oregon, so I never got to see him. And he lived to be 92. He was told he was going to die before he was 20. Um, but he's he was um, big into orthomolecular medicine, which is the idea that we each have our own individual metabolism, and we need to figure out that balance point. Um, and would definitely be into whole food, plant-based. He'd probably be horrified at the amount of processed food right now. Uh, but the idea of bond polarity comes from this, the electronegativity. You need to know that fluorine is the greediest. And oxygen is number two. That's pretty much, and as you move towards that corner, um, nitrogen and chlorine kind of tie, but they are pooling. So bond polarity is that one of the atoms, the more electronegative pools. So the more electron greedy uh, pools. And that creates the polarity. So in your study set and worksheet tonight, we talked about overall polarity, which is what we're getting to. Why it's important, uh, it determines if you're water soluble or not. So are you hydrophobic? or hydrophilic. I have to find my blue pen.
which is why like the water theme that of the week um, it is because we are water based, uh, polar and nonpolar. So things, that's why the whole thing with the polar bears down here. Let's, let's go through these questions. Comparing bonds. So carbon to carbon, if you are bonding with yourself, this is now emphasizing what you just did in your study set. This is why I flipped it and you did that study set first in hopes that this starts making sense because usually nobody understands polarity and it is. The really one of the key concepts we do this whole term. Anytime it's something to itself, it is nonpolar. So there's no pulling happening. The other one I told you you needed to know. Anybody carbon hydrogen pull or not? Like all these things going on, I just see flashing going on. It is carbon hydrogen is non-polar. There is no pool happening. That is what this table is all about. Now, this gets actually more detail than that. Um, you don't need to write this down. I'm not going to write it down because then you'll all write it down that what Linus Pauling defined polarity was a difference of electronegativity more than 0.4. So the difference between carbon and hydrogen was 0.4. Anything greater than that, you have a pool. We don't need to worry about that. If we see different types of atoms, it's going to be pooling. The one you need to remember is carbon hydrogen is no pool. Um, and we know that because it doesn't mix with water. Um, when things mix with water, they have to have a pool, and that's the attraction to the water. So here, the nitrogen would be pooling. So this is definitely polar. Here, the fluorine is pooling. That would be polar. We know nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, they always pool, not. And then the last one is special. Anybody see what's special about the last one? Everybody's so shy. My my theory is these other people are here, but they don't have my sound on. Is it ionic? Is it ionic? They are. Thank you, Nancy. All right. <laughs> oh, we made it to 10. We're almost halfway. Um, they are ionic. And so actually, there should not be a line there. Ionic do not bond. They're an attraction, but that is actually important to remember. It didn't happen in the homework. I don't know why. Um, it's an ionic attraction, so it's not polar. Polar and nonpolar is specifically a covalent bond um, attribute. All right, molecule polarity is um, if you have an, an asymmetry. then there is a pool. And we're going to go back and look at that with our molecules. But I wanted to go ahead and finish this page while we're here. Maybe I do have a blue pen. Um, so why is water special? Because we are water-based. Um, this planet is water-based. And so hydrophobia is things that are non-polar. Water is polar. So H2O is definitely polar. That oxygen is pooling. It makes the H bonds because of that huge polarity. And so solubility, polar bears do not mix with non-polar bears. Um, and so things that are hydrophobic are non-polar. Solubility, anything that is polar will mix with polar and non-polar will mix with non-polar. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go back and finish this last column. And so um, it's probably because it's the last column, all of these other columns. So the pictures were there so we could get the idea of the bond angle to get the molecular geometry. And the reason we're doing that is so we can look at it and be able to see if there is a pool or if there's no pooling. So the word polar just means there's a pool. And again, it's it's actually a magnetism that happens, um, which is really cool. We're really these little magnets inside of us. 
Uh, and so oxygen, the NOF, has a pool. All right, I am blessed with, when I look at this page, all of these molecules, I see them in front of me, and they're in three dimensions, just like these are. Uh, it took me about 10 years. I have a twin brother, and we were masters of geometry. We're still famous at our elementary school where we learn geometry. Um, and so it's just, I see in three dimensions, and I assumed everybody did, and it turns out most people don't. So most of you see this, everything is flat. Um, and somebody in here probably also sees it in three dimensions. So in this class, this works in this class. It doesn't work in my other class. But in here, we can do a Sesame Street rule. It's how I used to teach it, and it actually works. Um, do you remember in Sesame Street, that little game, which one of these is not like the other? Can you tell me? Can you guess which one? Like Cookie Monster or Elmo would come in. I used to have a cookie monster puppet. I'll have to find him. Anyway, if you circled your clouds, if the clouds are all the same, you are nonpolar. Nothing is pooling. It is a pool around the center. So what's happening here, the oxygens are pooling. They are pooling equal but opposite each other. So their pooling cancels out. Same with this one. It is nonpolar. Students go, but there's a double bond. No, there's not. It's a resonance. All these have eight electrons. The electrons are just distributed different, but they're all oxygens. So as long as you have all the same around the center, they cancel out. All the all these oxygens are pooling. They cancel. It is nonpolar. If you read my story, this that molecule is actually the key to the story. As soon as something's different, as soon as one of your clouds is different, it is polar. All the rest on this page are polar. Lone electrons on the center in this class. Please note, I said in this class, uh, they are polar. Bents are polar. Tetrahedrals can be either or. If Anything around the tetrahedral is, is the only way a tetrahedral can be nonpolar is if all of these are the same. So if these were four chlorines, or if they were four fluorines, so Tatum, this is the question I said I would eventually get to. So on your worksheet for all of you, uh, there is carbon with four fluorines, and it is nonpolar because the carbon with four fluorines around it, there is no pooling happening. But as soon as something is different, it is polar. Now, question often comes up, what if you drew it as the chlorines across from each other? And my answer to you is, you can draw it however you want, but it is three-dimensional. And a tetrahedral is not flat. Nothing is across from itself. Nothing is across from anything in the tetrahedral. They're all at a 109-degree angle. The only way this can cancel out as if they're all white balls. So they all have to be fluorines or they all have to be chlorines. Um, as soon as one of them's different, you have a pool. And that polarity means these, these last four would all be hydrophilic. The top two would be hydrophobic. Now there's one more wee little trick I wanna mention here. We'll go back to this page. So hydrophobic is nonpolar. So hydrophilic, and I mentioned this in the video, but I want to add one last little piece to it. Hydrophilic, philic is Philadelphia. It was named for brotherly love, and so it's the Latin prefix for love. So they love water. So anything that is polar loves water. It will mix with water. And there's something else that mixes with water, uh, and it is ionic. And that is because ions have a charge and water has that polarity. So the charge, the negative of the oxygen will be attracted to the positive of the sodium and it will pull it apart. That's how it pulls acids apart. Um, and the positive area of the hydrogen will pull the fluorine towards it. Um, so anything that's ionic will also be hydrophilic. Um, only nonpolar things are hydrophobic. All right. Any questions before I stop recording? Let me 
stop recording.